Amen. 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 Thank you. You can be seated, guys. Yeah, sit down if you sit down if you can. <laughs> Hallelujah. Boy, those were good. I love that. I love the old hymns mixed in like that. Those things just kind of you know, that's our that's my heritage anyway. And I'll I'll speak about that in just a second in one of these one of these uh points that I have for you. We've been we've been studying the life of Jacob for the last five weeks. Let me let me just ask you this: After five weeks of studying Jacob, how many of you feel better about your family? Right, <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, after five weeks of studying Jacob, you ought to be greatly encouraged that if God can use a rascal like Jacob, man, God can use me. You know, we all tend to think of our lives in terms of of what we do and. And what we struggle with, and how uh, how accomplished we are in fighting the things that we struggle against. Well, we've been walking through the life of Jacob and watching all of the things he struggles with, and trying to learn some lessons from Jacob. The first week he was born, and he came out holding Esau's heel. He was wrestling for control coming out of the womb. And then in the next week, we saw the worst no good negotiation in the history of the world where Esau sells Jacob his birthright for a bowl of beans. And then we saw unexpected blessings as Rachel and Leah and the boys and all come along and how God blessed him in some very unexpected ways, coming through the back door and all of that. And then uh, last week, God surprised Jacob at Jabbok on the banks of the river. An enemy has grabbed me. Surprise, it's God. <laughs> and God surprises us all when he touches our life that, like that. Today, uh, we're kind of, if you want to think of it as coming down the home stretch, we're kind of rounding turn four. And uh, we're beginning to come down the home stretch of Jacob's life. And and we've seen him fight a lot of battles. We've seen him carry a lot of burdens. He's received a few blessings. He's a crafty old veteran, but he's still in need of the Lord to do something in his life. He still has issues that are going on. And so today, God has given Jacob instructions to go back to a place where he's been before and it's in chapter 35, beginning at the first verse. Look at it. Then God said to Jacob, arise and go up to Bethel. Now, you'll need to be aware, and, and you will stay aware today, that Bethel, that Jacob has, re, has renamed Bethel. Bethel was Luz and when he got there the first time, back in chapter 28. And he had this tremendous vision there. And when he saw God through his open eyes, he renamed the place Bethel, which means the house of God. So God said, arise and go back to Bethel and dwell there and make an altar there to God who appeared to you when you fled from the face of Esau, your brother. And Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, put away foreign gods, everybody say idols, that are among you, purify yourselves, and change your garments. So obviously Jacob has not exerted any spiritual authority in his family. And his family are, they're a bunch of pagans. They worship false gods, they, they wear jewelry, they, uh, they just exhibit no allegiance to Jehovah whatsoever. And here comes Jacob now, obviously beginning to take some authority in his, ha in his house for the spiritual value of his house. And, he says, get rid of that stuff, verse three, then let us arise and go up to Bethel and I'll make an altar there to God who answered me in the day of my distress and has been with me in the way which I have gone. So they gave Jacob all the foreign gods which were in their hands and the earrings which were in their ears. And Jacob buried them under the terebinth tree which was by Shechem. Now, the terebinth tree we're not familiar with, but it's also called the turpentine tree. It's a, it's a majestic type of tree in the land. Uh, any type of tree over there that's above a scrubby bush would be a majestic tree, a landmark. And it's called, and like I said, it's called the turpentine tree because it makes it some form of turpentine. And, and it's, uh, it, it, has, it can grow like 40 feet tall with a big 
foliage, a big coverage, and the leaves are very dark green. So this would be a landmark that would be something that you could find if you started looking again. And evidently, there was a famous terebinth tree, and Jacob digs a hole under it and takes all these idols and this jewelry and all of that kind of stuff, and he hides them under there, uh, which I think speaks to the fact that in order to go forward, uh, you have to bury your past. And and you have, to, you have to have a funeral for those things in your life that, that enslave you, that, that hinder you, that rob from you. And so before they can go forward, Jacob says, give me all of that stuff that enslaves you and hinders you and is robbing from you. And he buries it. He has a funeral for it right there under the terebinth tree, verse 5. And they journeyed, and the terror of God was upon the cities that were all around them, and they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. So Jacob came to lose what that is Bethel, which is in the land of Canaan, he and all the people who were with him. Now, remember, it was, it was Luz, um, which, by the way, was in the middle of nowhere, where Jacob came the first time he was running from Esau going to Uncle Laban's house. And Luz was just a wide spot on the path out in the middle of nowhere. But Jacob, when he lay down and saw God in that vision of the angels going up and down the ladder, and he opened his spiritual eyes and saw God with, with real eyes, with real spiritual eyes, he changed the name to Bethel. Verse 7 and he built an altar there, and he called the place El Bethel. Uh, El in Hebrew just means God. So he named the place God of the house of God. So he called it El Bethel because there God appeared to him when he fled from the face of his brother. So God often speaks to us in, in two very disturbing places in life. Often God has to collectively bring us, I, I think, to places where he can speak to us, where we will listen to what he says and we'll hear him. And those two places, one are places of transition and the other are times of trouble. Jacob was in transition the first time he came to Bethel. He was fleeing from Esau. He was a fugitive that was running for his life. He had bought the birthright. He had stolen the blessing. And remember, Esau has arrows, right? And he was running to his mother's brother, Uncle Laban's house, where he had never been before. He didn't know where he was going. He didn't even know Uncle Laban, had never been around Uncle Laban, and he was running for his life. It was, a, it was a place of transition in Jacob's life where God spoke to him the first time at Bethel, and now after a lot of family dysfunction and a lot of treachery, some of it so graphic that it's really very difficult to talk about and now God has sent him once again back to a place where God has used before to challenge him, a place called Bethel. So here's his first trip, Genesis 38, verse 10. Now Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. And it's important to know this because Jacob has left his home, a comfortable place. You know, he lived, he dwelt among the tents is what the scripture said, which meant he was kind of a homeboy. He was kind of a mama's boy. He, he, he did things like cook and knit and sew and do. He did, he did those kind of things. So he was mom's favorite and, and it was very comfortable for him to be at home. And so he leaves this very comfortable place to set out for a place that is unknown to him, to stay with, with, with Uncle Laban, who is unknown to him. And here he is at Bethel, and he's, he, he's on his way, and he sees God like he's never seen God before. If 
you've ever been in a place of transition in your life, I would submit to you that as God dealt with you in that place of transition, you probably saw God like you've never seen before. And, and, and I'm so glad and thankful. I, I've had many transitions in my life. I have had many alterations in my life. Many directions that I thought I was going right and then all of a sudden God changes the direction. And I've had some that God has blown out from under me, if you catch my drift. And I'm just gonna tell you something. You don't want God to have to blow you out of somewhere because he's not gentle about it. But the great thing about God is that no matter how you get to that place of transition, God is going to show up in, the, in those transitional moments of your life. I mean, when you're unsure, when we, we used to have a, an old word we used to use for, for being trans, transitional, but discombobulated. Uh, you, you, you're, you're, you're confused. You, where, where am I going? Uh, how am I gonna get there? What, what's changed about this? How, all, how has all this happened? And then, and then God shows up right in the middle of the, of the nowhere in, in your life, just like he did with Jacob here. So God shows up. Jacob is on his way to somewhere. He's sitting out in the middle of nowhere, and here comes God showing up in this transitional time in Jacob's life. Look at verse 11. So he came to a certain place, and look, it's not even distinct enough to be named. It's just called a certain place, <laughs> you know, any, anywhere. And he stayed there all night because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of that place and put it at his head. And he lay down in that place to sleep. How could that be comfortable? I don't know. I have enough trouble going to bed and going to sleep many times with a very soft and comfortable pillow in bed. But here he is. He's going to sleep. He must have been extremely tired. Verse 12, then he dreamed and behold, a ladder was set up on earth and its top reached to heaven and there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. So there's this divine activity. He's, he, he's, he's dreaming he's, and he sees this vision of this divine activity where, where there's angels going up into heaven and coming down from heaven. And, and behold, verse 13, the Lord stood above it which is a wonderful thing. God's always above the situations in our life. We always have access to God. God is always there and available to us. That's what Hebrews says, let us come boldly under the throne of grace that we may find grace, uh, may find mercy and grace to help in time of need. We're, we're always invited and God is standing there and said, I'm the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac, the land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your descendants. So this is, this is the sign. God has given him this vision and God is and he's letting him see himself. And this is, the, this is the sign of his inheritance that God's got a promise. See, God's making him a promise here. I'm gonna give you all of this and I'm gonna bless you and so forth. And here's the vision to confirm that I'm, I'm the one speaking to you. Verse 14, also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south, and you and your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So the reason God brings you somewhere, the reason God brings me somewhere is so he can bless me, right? He takes us where he would have us to be so he can bless us. And why does he want to bless us? so that we then in turn can be a blessing to others. God doesn't bless our life just, so, just to bless us. God blesses our life in order for us to be a blessing to others in life with the same blessing that he blessed us with. That's really basically what 2 Corinthians 1 says, uh, 2 Corinthians 2 says about God in our life. He blesses us so we can bless others. All right, verse, four, verse 18. Uh, 17, say 15. Thank you, doll. Uh, 13, 12, uh, yeah. all right. 
Behold, I am with you, verse 15. Behold, I am with you. You were right. And will keep you wherever you go. And I'll bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. Now remember, this is his first time through. And he's now on his way back. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I did not know it. And he was afraid and he said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Then Jacob rose early in the morning and took the stone that he had put at his head, set it up as a pillar, set, set it up as a pillar. That's not redneck for pillow. That's a stone statue. He sets this rock up like a, like a pillar, like a stone statue. And he pours oil on the top of it. And of course, you remember, I've, I've mentioned to you about the oil and why God anointed with oil because the oil is shiny. And when you pour it all over it, it makes the whole thing shine, which represents the Shekinah, the outward, visible, present, brilliant glory of God. So anointing is just a representation and a reminder of the glory, the transcendent Shekinah glory of God. So he pours oil on it, verse 19, and he called the name of that, that place Bethel, the house of God, the gate of heaven. But the name of that city had been Luz previously. It doesn't sound very prosperous before, right? Loserville, I mean Luz, uh, nowhere. Uh, place so insignificant, really, you wouldn't even notice. So in the place where Jacob is just passing through, get it now, in the place he's just passing through, God shows up and does two things here for Jacob. First of all, he reveals his presence to Jacob, and then he makes Jacob a promise because God will show up in the middle of our nowhere. When you're down to nothing, when you have no one, <laughs> and I, I know when you have no one, God shows up in the middle of nowhere and God says that he is with you, that you might not have people, you might not have possessions, you might not have have property, but God says, you've got me, my presence and you've got my promise. And so because God shows up in the middle of Jacob's nowhere with his presence and his promise, Jacob now looks at the place where he is and he says, I'm not going to call this place lose anymore. This, this is not loserville anymore. This man, this is, this is, this is, God is in this place. This place has changed because God's presence is here and God has given me a promise. I'm gonna rename this place. It's no longer Loserville to me. It's now the house of God, which says to us that, listen, we can name the place that we're in when we know that the presence of God is with us. We can rename the situations of, that we're facing in life because with God, if he is with us and his promise is with us, no situation in life, no drastic place in life is a setback. It, it's, it, it's, a, it's a setup. I mean, look, we, we, some of us, we need to take naming rights to some of these places where we find ourselves in life. We need to rename some of these places that seem to be so hard in our life because I know what it used to be called, but I'm not going to call that anymore because it's not a setback, it's a setup. I'm not going to call it Loserville anymore because it's the house of God. I'm not going to call this the end. I'm going to call it the beginning. Why? Because God has given me a promise. And he's going to be faithful to his promise. 
And so here we are at a place of transition in chapter 28, and he's on his way for the future. Now, 21 years later, God sends Jacob back to the place where we just read about, back to the place where Jacob had his deepest experience with God. And I believe God's word for us today is that we would go back to our Bethel, that we would go back to that place in the middle of nowhere where God met you and where God brought you out of nothing. Because many times in order to go forward in life, and while you're on your way to somewhere, we have to learn how sometimes to go back to where God first touched us and God changed our life and revealed his presence and made a promise so that we can go forward. So three precepts, three precepts at Bethel. Number one, Bethel is a place of remembrance. I'm going back to Bethel, you know why? Because I need to remember some things. Quite often in the scripture, by the way, God says remember lots of times. We always want to learn something new. But the key to where we're going could be wrapped up not in learning something new, but to remember something that we've already seen. Jacob, you know, was about 100 years old at this point. Jacob had seen a lot. He had experienced a lot. But God says, Jacob, you need to go back and you need to remember some things. And when you remember these things, it's going to affect your life. That's one of the reasons why it's been so great to start a church from scratch. Because you remember, you experience everything that the church experiences and we all experience it together. And I'm telling you, over the 14 years that we've been a church, we have, we have experienced tremendous things together, exciting things together. I mean, I've watched people's lives grow that are unbelievable. There are people that play these instruments. When we started, when, when we started uh, Freedom River, Justin could barely, I mean, he could play a few chords and strum along and, and sing a little bit. John, I don't even think had thought about playing a guitar at that point. All of our bass people, they hadn't done anything. Drummers, uh, our whole band, Joe could play, but he, he didn't play very much. So he, he just wasn't, you know, super confident about the, his abilities. But but, but all of them were willing to just say, okay, what can I do and how can I help? Our sound room, you know, we didn't even have a sound man back then. We had somebody that sat at a little table with a little thing, something about this big and just, you know, tried to adjust it and make it where it wasn't, wouldn't ring and be too loud and all that. And we had one little camera set up. It was like a, one of those little uh, cameras that had the tape in it, uh, cassette tape in it, and, and it, it filmed and stuff. I mean, uh, hey, I, we, went, we were at the movie theater for an entire year of our life where we were traveling out of a trailer. We had all the equipment. Everything you see on this stage and everything you see in the nursery and the kids' rooms, we didn't have chairs like this, but, but everything else was in a, a, a closed-in trailer. And we roll that thing out about 7.30 on Sunday morning to the back of that door at the cinema down here at Cinemark and we unloaded everything out of that trailer, set it up. We had to have lights and everything because we were setting up in a movie theater. Didn't have any lights or anything. And we had to set everything up. And, and we had a whole crew that met us there every day, every Sunday, and set up everything. It took us about an hour and 15 minutes or so to set it up. It took us about 45 seconds to take everything down. It was unbelievable. But do you know this? And this is a, this is a true word from the Lord. We went an entire year unloading that trailer and loading that trailer at the end. It, we had to be out of the theater by 11.30 because at 11.30, the movie started showing on the screen up there. 
and people started coming in to watch the movies. So we, not, we, it wasn't like you had to be saying amen or having the invitation by 1130. You had to be out. You had to have all your equipment out, everything. So at about 1115, we would say amen, and then it looked like a pack of ants just you know, carrying everything out, everything out, everything out, and we set it on the sidewalk out there, and then we'd be able to load it into the trailer because we were out of the building. But I can tell you this, we went an entire year like that. It never rained on us one time. Not one time did it ever rain while we were unloading or loading equipment. Now, it might have rained during the church service, but whenever it stopped, the rain stopped. And one time, this is phenomenal, we're down here, the com community road leads to Cinemark, and then when you get to Cinemark Theater, it has a little frontage road that goes around the theater like this. I have been pulling that trailer down Community Road, and it is raining cats and dogs. And when I get to that little, that little drive I have to turn into the cinema, the cinema parking lot is dry as a bell, sun shining, not an inch of rain. It's just like the rain just stops right there, and then we drive into the sunshine. All kinds of things. I think of people that have made such tremendous Access to our church, Katie, bless her heart, she's with the Lord, we'll see you one day. Brother Charles, with the Lord, we'll see you one day. I mean, people that just gave of themselves. Chris, bless his heart, he runs sound. Isaac and Naley have always been super. I mean, they're just brilliant geniuses that we couldn't do without. They do everything, unbelievably. All this stuff you see and everything running and all of that, they make that happen. Cameras, Chris, uh, bless his heart, he, he, uh, he was coming to church and, and he made the comment, we got a digital board. We, we transitioned from old analog stuff to digital stuff and I remember him saying, um, Pastor, he said, if you, if you need any help with that now, he said, you know, I, my degree is in this kind of stuff and, and I'm, I'm willing to help you. If, if you need, you just call me. So on the week we were going to use it, I started reading the manual on how, on how to use this thing, and I finally figured out by Tuesday night how to turn it on, and um, it lit up like a rocket ship. I mean, it, it has more lights. I, I wish we could just have a camera, y'all could just look at that thing. It looks like a, a rocket ship. And I finally turned it on, and, and of course now you gotta do all kinds of adjustments and all kinds of everything, unbelievable, untold things. And I called Chris. I, for, I was sitting right up there and I called him. I said, Chris, I said, you said you, if I need you to call you, well, brother, I need you. I have no idea what I'm doing here. And I, I, I can't even do it, much less train anybody else to do it. Can you come help me? And I declare I'm serious. I think it was, that, I think it was maybe 30 minutes later, he was up there. And he worked day and night. I mean, it wasn't for seemingly months, you could come down to this church building anytime in the day or night, and he would be here, adjusting out things, doing things, learning things. Unbelievable. And I mean, you, these are the experiences you have, and you remember them, and then you remember how good God is. And, 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 the, and the, the word God gave us, and, and then I'm going to move on because I'm reminiscing too long. But this one thing, uh, and, and Belle, uh, Belle, bless her heart, she, she reiterated it. I preached a message about the widow of Zarephath and her son and Elijah the prophet. And Elijah comes into the town and the widow is out gathering sticks. And, 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 and he says, uh, what you doing? And she says, well, I'm gathering up a few sticks because I'm gonna cook a, a little bit of meal with a little bit of oil and I'm gonna cook uh, me and my son our last meal. And Elijah said, uh, before you cook you some, cook me one. And she did. She, she honored the man of God. And she cooked him one first. And he looked at her and he said, because you've been obedient to God, your meal barrel is never going to run out. And your oil barrel will never run dry. And I remember Bev standing up and saying at that moment, like she, she does. She said, Pastor, that's a word of God for us. And what God is saying is, look, whatever you need, 
whatever you need, just reach your hand into the barrel and I have the meal for you. And, and here's the thought I've kept all through these years. Our meal barrel never has run over. In other words, there's never been a time where I look at the meal barrel and it's just running over and I can go, whew, man, oh, we got plenty. Oh, God, thank God. But although it's never run over, it's never run dry either. And every need we have ever had, big or small, whatever it might be, I've just had to reach my hand into the barrel and it's always there. Those are the promises of God. That's remembering. That's God taking us back to a place of transition so that we can remember some things because he wants me to remember what he did for me and what his presence were for me because sometimes you have to look at people and you have to look at the things that God has done and you have to remember Bethel. Sometimes you got to go back so that you can go forward in life. You know, back when things were tight, back when things were tough, back when the money was low, back when the bills were high, back when you, you didn't have resources and you didn't have people and you didn't have anything like that. And, you, and God takes you back so that you can just dip your hand in and remember the goodness of God. And sometimes when I'm dragging low, and I don't know, I guess you've experienced those times where I'm just seemingly trudging through the gates of hell, I have to go back to my heritage. And I mentioned this a while ago about my heritage. I was, I was, I, I was saved 50 years ago in a, in a country church outside of Meridian, Mississippi, Carmel Baptist Church, right outside Meridian, Mississippi, 16 years old. And we didn't have, we had a, we had a piano and we had an organ. And we had old wooden pews that every time you sit down on them, they'd just creak and pop. And <laughs> But man, I want to tell you what. We would raise the roof with those old hymns we used to sing. And that became part of my heritage and part of my life. And lots of times now when things just seem overwhelming and just un unending and unnerving, I just have to kind of reach back and grab, grab one of those things and just and just let it rattle around in my heart, you know, <laughs> and just let it speak to me. When darkness seems to hide your face, I rest on your unchanging grace, right? In every high and stormy gale, the anchor holds within the veil. What's the next words? On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. You know what a bulwark is? A bulwark is something that's set up that you can't knock down. When peace like a river attends my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. You see, the first time Jacob comes to Bethel, he's running, he's talking fast, he's making deals. But now in chapter 35, He's limping in to Bethel because of all of the things that have happened to him in life. And God says, I want you to remember some stuff. So Bethel is a place of remembrance. Second, Beth, Bethel is a place of revelation where God reveals some things. The first time Jacob stumbles through Bethel, he's thinking, uh, I'm not sure where I am and I'm not sure where I'm going, but surely the Lord's is in this place. By the time he comes back, many things have happened. He's met someone that's more er than him. He's crafty, Laban is craftier. He's shrewd, Laban is shrewder. Beautiful Rachel, I'll water those sheep for you. Behold, it was Leah. <laughs> the 11 boys. The miracle of the speckled and spotted sheep and lamb that God did. Laban pursues him when he leaves and then God steps in front of Laban and says, if you're gonna, if you're gonna get to him, you gotta go through me. Laban says, I'm going back home. And he turns around and he goes back home. And then Jacob wrestles with Jesus at Jabbok and Jesus knocks his hip out of joint. The very next day, he reconciles with Esau. Remember, Esau steps off his horse, walls over, hugs him and kisses him. 
His sons do some terrible things at Shechem in chapter 34. So what was once a general, general statement, surely the Lord is in this place, now becomes a revelation to him. In chapter 35, I think I've got this passage you can put up there. Verse three, then, this is Jacob, then let us arise and go up to Bethel and I'll make an altar there to God. Listen, look, look. who answered me in the day of my distress and who has been with me everywhere I've gone. So the little general understanding of, hey, surely the presence of the Lord is here has now become, God is with me and he's been with me everywhere I go. So God calls Jacob back to Bethel. He has now gone full circle. He started at Bethel and now he's gone full circle through to reveal to Jacob through all of those distresses in life that God has been with me, not just in that place, but God has been with me everywhere I've gone. This is a revelation because God's not a place. God is a person. And God goes with you wherever you go. This is why Isaiah said, and Matthew reiterates, and you shall call his name, what? Emmanuel, which means what? God with us. So Jacob says, I see now. Put that nowhere and now here up there, babe. Jacob now says, I see now. God shows up in the middle of nowhere and reveals that he is a very present help in time of trouble, in the middle of hopelessness and helplessness and hurt, horror, uh, life. God shows up so your eyes can be opened up to the revelation that God not only meets us in our nowhere, but God is now here. This ever faithful God, this ever promising God is not just the God of nowhere, but he is now here. I know it's not Christmas time, but let me read Luke 2. Uh, this is a couple of things out of Luke 2. Because this is such a tremendous revelation. This is a revelation now because Jacob didn't know this. He didn't understand this. He, he thought, okay, at Bethel, God was with me. At Bethel, God was surely in this place. So God brings him back to Bethel so he can reveal that God not only at Bethel, but God was with him everywhere he went. Look at Luke 2. Now, there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields. Everybody say, in the middle of nowhere. There were shepherds living out in the middle of nowhere keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them and the glory of the Lord shone round about them and they were greatly afraid, sore afraid, I love that word. Yeah. Then the angel said to them, do not be afraid for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy which shall be to all people for there is born to you this day in the city of David a savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You'll find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace and goodwill toward men. And Isaiah said, and his name shall be called Emmanuel, God with us. So here the shepherds are in the middle of nowhere hearing an announcement that God in the flesh, Emmanuel, God with us, the one they had been waiting on, is now here. That's the revelation. You get that at Bethel. It's not only a place of remembrance, it's a place of revelation. Here's the last precept. Bethel is a place of response. I know that sounds, this sounds like an old sermon, doesn't it? Those points, Bethel's a place of remembrance. <laughs> Bethel's a place of revelation. Bethel's a place of response. Yeah, that sounds like an old one. But it is a place of response. Let me show you what I'm talking about. The first time Jacob went to Bethel, he was running real good. He was young and crafty. Well, he was 76 years old, but he lived, he lived a lot. About, he lived 130 years at least. So he was middle-aged when he first came through there. He was running real good. The second time he comes to Bethel, he limps in. The first time he comes to Bethel, 
he was making deals with God. I told you about the vision that he had, right, of the ladder and the angels. But he also made a vow there. Put it, I think it's on the screen, put it up there, Genesis 28. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and keep me in this way that I'm going and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on so that I come back to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone which I have set up as a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. Now, I'm not a contract lawyer, but to me, that sounds like a contract. If you will do this, then I will do this. This is what Jacob does, guys. This is, this, Jacob makes deals. So this is, this is a contract. But when Jacob goes back to Bethel, he's not running fast, talking fast, and making deals. He's limping into Bethel this time. The first time, he was young and full of vim and vigor. Now, 21 years later, he's been through lots of stuff in life. And he's a broken man. He's a changed man. God's even changed his name to Israel. And he limps back into Bethel. And look at what happens in verse 30, uh, chapter 35, verse 14. So Jacob set up a pillar. Look, in the place where God talked with him. A pillar of stone and he poured a drink offering on it and he poured oil on it. And Jacob called the name of the place, look, where God spoke with him, Bethel. I'm just pointing that out because the first time Jacob was at Bethel, he did all the talking. If you'll do this, God, and if you'll do this, and if you'll take care of that, if you'll give me this, and if you'll do this, and you'll take care of that, then I am gonna make you my God, and I'm gonna be obedient, I'm gonna do everything you say, and I'm even gonna give you a tenth of everything you give me. How about that, God? Is that a good deal? The first time Jacob goes to Bethel, Jacob is doing all the talking. But he's now been through some things, and Bethel is no longer the place where he talked to God, Bethel has become the place where God talked to him. And this time, Jacob doesn't say a word. Jacob does not say a word. He just builds an altar. When you think of an altar, when we think of an altar in our day, we think of a nice padded kneeler right up here at the front of the church. But an altar in Jacob's day was not a nice padded kneeler in the front of some sanctuary somewhere. An altar was a place of sacrifice and a place of death. It was a place where the blood of bulls and rams and goats and, and doves and even drink offerings were poured out as a sacrifice to God, where you poured out the life of the innocent to cover the sins of the guilty. So what should we do, pastor? Jacob built an altar. So should we build an altar? I mean, do we need to get some stones and some wood and, and, and get some hooks to hang the sacrifices and blip, drip the blood? I mean, is that what we need to do in our altar? No, the Apostle Paul told us about this. In, in the book of Hebrews, or excuse me, in the book of Romans chapter 12, and in the first verse, and here's what the Apostle said, Paul says to us. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice to the Lord, which is holy and acceptable to God, and this is your reasonable service. 
So our altar is not a place where we pour out the blood of animals and, and, and drink offerings. Paul's saying to us, build an, alf, build an altar in your Bethel, in, in your heart. Build an altar in your heart and, and take a good look at, at how, God, how far God has brought you. Because you see, God didn't just show up in Jacob when he got to Bethel. God was there all along. And it only required that Jacob would open his eyes, would open his spiritual eyes and see that God was there all along. God doesn't just show up at our crisis moments and at our times of transition and when we are in trouble. God is with us all along the way. And it only requires us to open our spiritual eyes by remembering what God did for us, by recalling how God delivered us and how God changed our life by experiencing what it felt to have the burdens of, of our guilt and sin lifted and rolled away, and by allowing the Holy Spirit to speak to us, to reveal to us things that God would say to us right now. And it changes our life. God calls us back to Bethel so that he can change our life, so that he can take us to where he, was, where he wants us to be in life. Back to Bethel. All right, bow your heads with me, would you please?